sometimes advice is great and can be just the thing, right? If you if you stumble on the right advice at the right moment. But uh, a big message of my book and my work is that um, too often we sort of reach for the shiny idea that sounds like it might work for us instead of taking the time to really look at what are the barriers, what is it we specifically need to tailor, um, the tools that we use to reach our goals. And I think the same is true of advice, that it's often not tailored to a specific situation, that we often stumble across uh, you know, the wrong advice at the wrong moment that doesn't address our needs. What really jumped out at me while reading your book was that um, it almost estimated the problems that I was facing, and then it offered solutions working backwards. So, um, for instance, do, who is Brad Gilbert and uh, why should all of us know about him? As soon as you become sophisticated about forgetting and start using those kinds of tools, better outcomes ensue. And so I think it's, it's just so important to structure your life with a recognition that you are going to forget things if you don't if you don't, you know, set up timely reminders, if you don't have checklists and tools. Hi, Katie. It's such a pleasure to have you here. I'm in a small village in the Middle East, uh, you know, an hour from Beirut, and the internet is patchy, the electricity is not here, but I'm thrilled uh, to be hosting you because your book, How to Change, made a huge impact in our life on Network Capital. We're a career exploration and experimentation company and mentoring is core to what we do and uh, some chapters made a huge difference to how we approach the subject so thanks so much for joining us to share the insights of your book oh thank you for having me i'm thrilled to be here and i'm, I'm glad that the book was helpful Yes, it was. So, um, you know, just uh, let's get started. Uh, you were a PhD student in engineering. How did this career transition happen? Um, one of the fellowships that we run on Network Capital is called I Don't Know What I, what I Want to Do With My Life Fellowship. Have you ever had that feeling where you don't, didn't know what you wanted to do with your life? And how did this PhD in engineering to, you know, a professorship at what happened in, in psychology? Yes. I mean, if, if anyone tells you they never knew what they wanted to do with their lives, they'd probably be lying. I don't think I've met <laughs> anyone who always had it all figured out. And I certainly didn't. <laughs> um, when I started college, in fact, I think I thought I wanted to work as a consultant maybe, or um, maybe an entrepreneur. I had no inkling that I would ever be interested in academia. And actually, it wasn't until I was required to do a bit of independent research in college, a senior thesis, that I fell in love with, um, you know, data and numbers. I was an engineer as an undergraduate. You also referred to my PhD, which was in engineering and business. I sort of started to notice that I was interested in problems related to people and social science to some degree um, during my time doing um, my undergraduate thesis. I studied of all things, uh, operations research as an undergraduate and American studies was my minor because I loved reading fiction and I wanted to both sort of do engineering but also get to read novels for classes. <laughs> and that's how I, I bridged those divides. And then I was required at my university to write a, a senior thesis, a, an original work of, um, of academic, of an academic nature that covered sort of and bridged those two topics. So I was forced to come up with something kind of different. And I ended up studying, um, or I concocted a study that where I quantified um, New Yorker fiction. So I read a decade of fiction, characterized features of the fiction, and um, tested hypotheses about whether or not changes in editorial staff changed the nature of the work that was being published, and also whether authors tended to write fiction about characters who resembled them, them demographically. And I did this all with you know, big statistical analyses, but so, so here I am like combining American studies, that's the fiction, American, um, American fiction component and sort of my operations research hat. So I'm doing this quantification. It was the most fun thing I ever done in my whole life. I absolutely loved everything about it. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, wait, maybe I wanna have a career as an academic. 
but all I knew really was like the numbers side. And so I did this PhD in engineering. And while I was a PhD student, I had another discovery that I made, which was that I'd hated economics as an undergraduate. I thought it was full of ridiculous assumptions about human nature that made no sense. And then I stumbled on in a required microeconomics class for my graduate work, this new growing field of behavioral economics where, um, people were being modeled in a way that I found much more realistic and believable. The, the foibles that we all had were being quantified. So the fact that we were, you know, victims of temptation, that we often were impulsive, that we put off doing the things that were in our long-term best interest, for instance, was being modeled. It's called present bias by economists. And they were trying to quantify to what degree are we present biased? Um, you know, there are many other feature sort of foibles being quantified too. And I said, wow, this is so cool. And so that was another pivot point where I realized, even though I was studying engineering, technically what I was really interested in was quantifying these elements of human nature and helping to fix it because engineers by nature are trying to sort of solve problems. And I realized right. I could apply that mindset to some of the problems that were being documented in human nature. And that, that is when I found my way, but it, it took a bunch of different sort of accidents and discoveries and reading the right book at the right time or meeting the right person at the right time. And in, you know, another life where I didn't have some of those accidents, I probably would be a consultant or an entrepreneur instead of an academic. Uh, that, that is fascinating. I mean, that is the approach that we take on network capital as well, like a whole bunch of micro experiments, keeping an open mind, measuring data and seeing in what direction that we want to change, uh, take our lives in. Because, you know, what found is that there's so much advice on careers all around, just the way there's so much advice on change all around. So my question to you, Katie, is that why is there so much advice and uh, why doesn't that advice on change work? Yeah. That's a great question. You know, sometimes advice is great and can be just the thing, right? If you if you stumble on the right advice at the right moment. But uh, a big message of my book and my work is that um, too often we sort of reach for the shiny idea that sounds like it might work for us instead of taking the time to really look at what are the barriers, what is it we specifically need to tailor um, the tools that we use to reach our goals. And I think the same is true of advice, that it's often not tailored to a specific situation, that we often stumble across, uh, you know, the wrong advice at the wrong moment that doesn't address our needs. And, um, and, and so trying to sort of seek out mentors who have similar uh, goals or who face similar stumbling blocks and, and look for people who are tackling the very things that we need to tackle so that we can get matched, well-suited advice can be a lot more useful than, than trying to sort of deal with the mess of, of tips out there that may not all really be applicable to our situation. Yeah. You know, what really jumped out at me while reading your book was that um, it almost estimated the problems that I was facing and then it offered solutions working backwards. So um, for instance, do, do, who is Brad Gilbert and uh, why should all of us know about him? I think that'll help our listeners understand this better. Brad Gilbert is a great tennis player, but a greater tennis coach. And um, I have to say, by the way, we were talking about journeys. The journey of writing a book is an interesting one. I had never done it before. I was a total novice. I had a lot of science I wanted to convey and trying to figure out how to communicate it in a way that would be you know, fun, enjoyable, digestible was an adventure. And um, this might sound funny, but I wrote the first chapter of my book last. Uh, you know, I wrote a bad first chapter first, then I ripped it up and then I rewrote. And the, the great pleasure of my book was that the first chapter, which I wrote last, is about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. It's about tennis of all things, even though I'm talking about change. It's about Brad Gilbert, who's one of my heroes. It's about Andre Agassi, a childhood hero. I was a tennis player as a kid. I played in college and I sort of found my way back to this introduction that told a story that was really meaningful to me and resonated to me. And I hope resonates for readers too. It's a story about change. It's a story about change though in tennis. And the change was, it was orchestrated by insights from Brad Gilbert, but it was a change in Andre Agassi's career. So for people who aren't tennis buffs and are listening, you might not know who Andre Agassi is, though I bet you've at least heard his name because he's one of the greats and he, uh, you know, in the, in the sports history. But in the 1990s, when I was a kid paying a lot of attention to sport um, and a big fan, he's not 
not doing so well. So he he had been a kid. Everyone expected great things. He was supposed to be one of the best in the world and had a lot of endurance, but mostly he was well known because he'd been really flashy in the clothes he chose to wear and the things he chose to say he wore lipstick to a match ripped jeans had crazy hair and he was um so he was known for his image but not for his achievements and all of these childhood rivals who he used to beat and everyone would be better than they were number one two in the world pete sampras um jim courier michael chang they were all dominating the rankings and agassi had fallen to about 30th in the world so things were bad he needed a change and this is where brad gilbert comes into the story so and helps figure out to do. Brad Gilbert was a player who actually had a lot less potential, arguably a lot less natural talent than Agassi, who had had sort of an amazingly good career, given that he wasn't that great of a player. And he wrote this best-selling book called Winning Ugly. And it was all about his approach to tennis, which was very strategic and very different than the way others had played. And he's struggling, things being apart, Agassi's coach, and that maybe together they could turn Agassi into one of the greats. And um, at this dinner, Gilbert is asked to analyze Agassi's game. Like, what's wrong? Why isn't Andre Agassi achieving his potential? And Gilbert says, you know, when I look at your game, what I see is a self-focused approach to tennis. You are not, you're going out there, you have all this talent, and all you're doing is, is sort of focusing on what you've got. And you're not spending any time analyzing your opponent. You never tailor your game. You never strategize. You never think about who you're up against. And then specifically sort of take them apart and figure out how to take them down. Instead, you're just going for the winners. And if you played a less self-focused game, a more strategic game, I think you could go all the way to the top. So Gilbert becomes Agassiz's coach, sort of the rest is history, but basically he goes from 30th in the world to winning the US Open that year, which is one of the great tournaments, uh, the, you know, the biggest tournament, he's unseated. No one expected him to do anything. He wins playing this very new game where he, every match he's figuring out what are my opponent's weaknesses? How can I take advantage? Not just how can I hit my perfect shots, but what am I up against and how can I tailor? And it was on to um, be number one in the world. And over the course of his career holds that position for over a hundred weeks, you know, there's more ups and downs, but that was a clear turning point. And I use the story to make the point that when it comes to any kind of change, not just changing your tennis um, outcomes, but any kind of change, we need to do just what Brad Gilbert said, which is we need to understand what are we up against? What's our opponent? And instead of tr trying to play a one size fits all strategy, we need to tailor our approach uh, to change. And that's, that's the main lesson at the center of my book. It's the main lesson I've learned in my career studying change is too often we're looking for these sort of flashy, it looks, it'll work always strategies like you know, visualize success and then you'll get where you need to be or set big audacious goals. That's all that it'll take. And instead, what I've seen is that we need to understand what is the barrier to change in our particular case? You know, am I, am I struggling to achieve change because I lack confidence? Is it because I'm forget, I'm forgetful? Is it um, that, uh, you know, inertia, like my habits are working against me? Is it that I am too uh, impulsive and in giving into temptation and temptation isn't aligned with my long-term goals? What is the barrier? And depending on what it is, the solution is going to be really different. That's going to work for you, right? If you forget to take your medication every night, then you need reminders. If you're not taking your medication because it has side effects and you sort of, those loom large, then you need a really different approach to sort of get yourself through that challenge. So the whole, the book is about all the scientific tools we've learned for helping people overcome different barriers. And it, it very specifically talks about what works in what situation instead of what works overall. Yeah, iterative, contextualized, uh, big learning for, for us here. Um, you're at Penn. Um, uh, we love fresh starts, uh, you know, according to your book. Did uh, Benjamin Franklin ever make a fresh start? Why are fresh starts important? Is Ben Franklin the perfect person that we all think he is? Well, there is no such thing as a perfect person. And certainly Ben Franklin um, had failings. I, I, I should say I'm not a Ben Franklin scholar, but I am a Ben Franklin super fan. He is <laughs> so amazing. Such a cool founder of the University of Pennsylvania and founding father of um, the United States. And like, wow, what an incredible, it's fun. I have a five-year-old and I, I constantly am saying like, oh yeah, Ben Franklin invented the lightning rod, you know, Ben Franklin. And, you know, uh, that's that's why we wear this kind of glass, these reading glasses and Ben Franklin and the constant Institution. It's just amazing all the things that he did, but he also was a great behavioral scientist and had a lot of insight into um, how to uh, achieve personal success. And um, he 
oddly enough, was a bit of a wastrel when he was a teenager and sort of a mess and like had a debaucherous period in London where he was like drinking too much, not achieving much. And um, the story is that then he took a boat back because there were no planes, of course, the, the boat was the <laughs> fastest mode of transit. He took a boat back to Philadelphia. And on this trip, um, they hit some unlucky currents and delays. And he ended up on this boat for months instead of weeks. And during this time, he uh, he felt like, okay, I'm, I'm at a turning point in life. I'm about to open a new chapter as I travel back from the period I've had of debauchery in London. I'm heading out home. I'm going to have a fresh start, um, a new era that I'm going to begin. And he made a bunch of resolutions as he, as he had this breaking point. Um, he set up a system of virtues that he wanted to achieve and a tracking system and um, for sort of giving him checks each day for different virtues he wanted to achieve when he, he nailed it and and um black marks when he had it and he was going to track his success and reward himself for success and you know we know that his life turned out pretty well and he was fairly successful maybe the most successful in terms of achieving goals of any human who has ever walked this earth um so who knows if it's really because of that pivot point but it was certainly a nice illustration of a fresh start and and this is a topic i have studied that there are moments in our lives that feel like chapter breaks when we turn out to be more motivated at those moments to pursue our goals, because we can sort of set aside the past and say, you know, that was the old me that wasn't doing so well. And the new me is going to be able to achieve more. So new year's is a chapter break. We all uh, right. are familiar with and often take advantage of, but there are many more from the start of a new week or a month to the celebration of a birthday to a move. Uh, these are moments when we have that sense of a clean slate and the research I've done with Heng Chen Dai of UCLA and um, Jason Reese, a senior fellow at Wharton, suggests at those moments, we're both more motivated uh, to pursue our goals. So we set goals at a higher rate, we go to the gym more frequently, and we can be nudged more easily. It seems when people point right. out a fresh start moment, we're more likely to capitalize on a change opportunity. Got it. And of course, like uh, the New Year um, resolutions don't often work. And in the book, people should read it. There are some very specific strategies outlined um, that you that you that I personally found quite useful. I wrote a bit about uh, how why New Year resolutions don't work. And by then, I hadn't read your book because it was not out. But now I do. Now it's time for me to go back and revise that article a little bit. <laughs> I, well, I, you know, I share the skepticism to some degree about New Year's resolutions. It's funny. Um, I should say that because I'd done all this research on fresh starts and it, you know, there's been a fair amount of media attention to it. Like every New Year's, it's a, it's a hot topic. Um, a lot of people, when they heard I was writing a book said, well, I assume you're writing a book about all about fresh starts, right? That's going to be the book. So that's sort of this thing that you've studied rigorously. That's important and related to change. And my response was, you know, that would be completely uh, useless in my opinion, or you know, not nearly useful enough because a fresh start, all it does is it's a springboard to begin. But if that's all you've got, you fall on your face, right? We need a lot more tools to create lasting change than a single moment of motivation to begin. And that's why it's a chapter of the book. Like, you know, this can be a helpful tool if you're having trouble getting started, which is a barrier to change for many, but it's only the beginning of the journey. There's so many other barriers we have to overcome in order to get anywhere. And I think that's why so many New Year's resolutions fail. It's this sort of shiny object bias, like, oh, all I need is the quick fix. And you think, oh, you know, if I just set a resolution, I will achieve it. And it's not nearly enough. We need a lot more. We need to understand all the other barriers to change and set ourselves up for success using what science has proven can work to overcome those. Absolutely. So Katie, do you like Mary Poppins? I love Mary Poppins. I already told no. you I have a five-year-old, so you know I love Mary Poppins. <laughs> uh, what did she teach you about uh, present bias? And what, why should we know about Mary Poppins? Well, you should know about Mary Poppins because, you know, the movie and the musical and, awesome. you know, the, yeah. the music, it's wonderful. And it's, you know, every parent should enjoy it with their child and every adult who doesn't have a child should enjoy it too. So that's the number one reason you should know about Mary Poppins. But it's also, she is also, it turns out, had some good advice that's relevant to behavior change, which is why she makes an appearance in my book. So um, she wrote, or she sings the song. She, she is a fictional character. Um, she sings the song written um, by others. The, the, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. And this song, it's sort of central premise. May, I think we have this intuition for kids. We get that 
if we don't make something fun, kids are not going to pursue a goal. They're not going to do anything, frankly, if it's not instantly gratifying. But too often we fail to appreciate that the same tendencies and the same challenges face us as adults. Um, there's wonderful research by by Ayala Fishbach of the University of Chicago and Caitlin Woolley of Cornell showing that when people want to achieve a new goal, what we normally do is we think the best way to get to that goal is just, I'm going to find the most effective approach for tackling it. So say you want to exercise more regularly and you want to get fit, you're going to look for the workout you can do that is going to get you to that fitness goal most efficiently, like, you know, maximally efficient. I'm going to use the Stairmaster, but a small fraction of people look for the most fun way to pursue their goals. So the Mary Poppins approach, right? They say like, well, I'm going to do Zumba classes with my friends and that's how I'm going to get in shape. And it turns out that the people who understand that they need to make it fun persist longer. And, and she's, they've, this team has done random assignment studies so, showing that if you tell people, try to pursue your goals in a way that's fun, as opposed to in a way that is going to be most effective, you see better outcomes. Because again, persistence matters. If the experience of pursuing the goal is enjoyable, you keep doing it. If it's unpleasant, you think you'll keep doing it, but you're wrong. You, you know, quit quickly because we care a lot about the instant gratification we get from an activity. And, and we tend to overweight that relative to the long-term benefits. So once we recognize this, I think we can use the Mary Poppins approach to get a lot further in life and to help other people get further by trying to find ways to actually make it instantly gratifying to pursue our goals. We can persist yeah. longer. And I'm happy to talk more about you know temptation bundling if you want, or just leave it at that. <laughs> I was just about to come to temptation bundling. When you started talking about uh, your interest in reading fiction, I would love to know how you sort of managed fiction, temptation bundling, and all the rigorous research that you do. What is it? Uh, what is the core concept? And how did you figure out, how did you hack your system? <laughs> yeah, so as a graduate student, I already talked about sort of pivots in life. But as a graduate student, I had uh, one particular personal challenge and then it, it grew into what I'll call me search. So I did some research about something that worked for me personally to sort of prove that it could be effective for others. So um, my personal challenge as a graduate student was that I would come home from a long day of tough classes, exhausted, and I had no interest in getting my work done, right? I was like, I don't want to do my homework right now. I'm just too tired. I also had no interest in going to the gym, which I knew would be good for my mental health and my productivity writ large, because again, I was tired and burned out. I just, all I wanted to do was binge watch TV and, or curl up on the couch with a juicy page turner. I, I've already told you that I love fiction and reading novels. <laughs> So um, what I realized is maybe I could solve both of these problems I, I was having with one, in one fell swoop with a system that I call temptation bundling. And lots of other people have similar systems. The solution I came up with was I would only allow myself to enjoy indulgent entertainment while I was exercising at the gym. So for me, some people do this with TV shows. I do it with novels, audio novels specifically. That's like the right amount of sensory input for me while I'm exercising and I, I'm a, a fiction junkie. So. I would let myself listen to, you know, Alex Cross, James Patterson novels, Harry Potter, but only while exercising at the gym. And what happened is I'd come home from a long day of classes and suddenly I'd be craving a trip to the gym to find out what happened next with Voldemort and Hermione, right? Or Alex Cross, whatever I was listening to at the moment, what's going to happen next in my book. Um, time would fly while I was at the gym. It was no longer a chore, but a pleasure because I was so engrossed in the entertainment. I didn't even notice the time passing. And then I'd come home rejuvenated, refreshed. I had my workout done. My, um, I, I felt excited, ready to dive into my work. I'd already gotten my entertainment fix and that was out of the way and there was no temptation to indulge again because I I set this rule I wasn't going to do it and I my grades improved so I found this tactic of bundling something that I found tremendously enjoyable that I craved and looked forward to a temptation with a chore could be useful um, to me and in other settings too I sort of started seeing ways to temptation bundle at other settings like only listen to my favorite podcast while I'm cooking a fresh meal or only allow myself to get a pedicure while catching up on reading I needed to do that was overdue for class like what whatever the temptation was link it with a chore and the chore becomes a pleasure as Mary Poppins would um, have approved mm -hmm. and and then I've studied this since so I've run um, research studies showing that temptation bundling can help us on average achieve more when it comes to things like exercise uh, in large populations. So it's not just me, but others also benefit from this tool. And it's just yeah. one way I think to make 
things fun. So it's really related to the research that Ayala and Caitlin did later. Actually, it's sort of funny how this timelines work out. I studied temptation bundling and I realized, oh, they had the bigger insight and this sort of fits into that picture beautifully that it's one way that we can make it more enjoyable in the moment so we will persist on our long-term goals. And you've collected a ton of data on this, right? At, uh, at uh, the experiment that you run since, like now you have so many data points. I was wondering if, uh, um, if there were new interesting examples that emerged in the pandemic where people used temptation bundling smartly, or perhaps you uh, used temptation bundling smartly uh, while gr grappling with the pandemic. That's a really interesting question. Um... You know, one of the best ways to temptation bundle actually was shut down during the pandemic because one way you can temptation bundle is making things social and that can right. make it much more enjoyable to pursue a goal when it's with someone else. It's a pleasure. And we couldn't do that. So I actually think in some ways, some of the best temptation bundles got destroyed during the pandemic. But I definitely have heard interesting examples of temptation bundling since sort of, you know, going on a book tour virtually, of course, and, uh, and talking about this research. And let's see, some of my favorite, one of my favorites was, this is just so, it's so different. Someone who to get her dissertation work sort of written and get that work done that she, she was procrastinating on, she loved scented candles and she would only allow herself to burn those while she was working. And so this became sort of like an aromatherapy ple pleasure. She started associating that people who um, were drinking more wine than they wanted to drink. And maybe this actually is a good pandemic one. Uh, and so only allowed themselves to have that glass of wine while cooking a fresh meal rather than ordering fast food for their family. And that sort of constrained and improved outcomes on two dimensions. So those, those are a couple that I had heard since I think, you know, I used to use like only allow yourself to pick up your favorite treat while going to the library to hit the books that becomes harder. Some of these like physical <laughs> locations were closed, but, but there were some new techniques I, I learned too. We tried out a bunch of these uh, techniques during the pandemic and they worked well. For example, we used to have some of these writing hours or social hours where people would you know, get to write together virtually. And at the end, there'll be a little reward, um, you know, which uh, was a, a type of temptation bundling, I thought. I love that. Yeah, no, that's great. And that that is a social feature and, and Zoom allows us to do a lot of yeah. things that seemed impossible once, but it's not quite the same, we have to. <laughs> that. Uh, tell me, um, do public pledges work? Are you a big believer of making social commitments, plastering it on your social media? I'm going to do this. Should people do such a thing? Like everything. Sometimes they work, right? And they, I think they can add and be helpful in some situations. It, it really depends on how, um, you know, how big the penalty will be and how much shame you will feel if you fail to achieve your pledge. So I put this in the category of something that academics call a commitment contract, which is one tool we can use or a, a kind of commitment device. It's a tool we can use to increase the likelihood that we won't procrastinate or give into temptation and not do things that we know we should do. And it's uh, we've been talking about sort of the carrot approach to making temptations or making our temptations go away. So we do the things that are in our long-term best interest, which is like make it fun so that it is instantly gratifying. There's also the stick approach and that is create some kind of penalty that will be associated with right. failure. One way of doing that, and this is a, I would say a weak or soft kind of commitment is through a pledge, a public pledge, right? And that creates some added cost associated with failure because you'll be humiliated perhaps if you've told everyone, you know, I'm going to learn French by the end of the year and I'm going to finish this Duolingo program. And then, uh, you know, every day you don't do it um, and you never get there. So you'll be humiliated that as a cost, it makes it slightly um, more of a, a priority. And if you're thinking about present bias, the tendency to put off, put things off, the higher the cost of doing so, the more likely we are to actually take action and do the things that are good for us in the long run. So pledges are one way, they're one tool we can use, and there is some evidence that they can be effective, but I just wanna say, I, I do not think they're, in many cases, they're not enough. Stronger commitment contracts are often more effective, even though they can be things that we don't might not wanna do. So one kind of commitment contract is you literally put money on the line in like a large amount that you will have to forfeit if you fail to achieve a goal. And there's evidence showing this can be useful. One of my favorite studies shows um, 
smokers who wanted to quit were randomly assigned to two different groups. One group, uh, just get sort of your traditional tools. Like here's how, how we are going to help you quit smoking. The other groups get group gets all the traditional stuff. Plus the opportunity to put money in an account that a savings account that they will have to forfeit in six months if they fail a nicotine and cotinine urine, urine test and people just allowed to put money in this account where they'd have to give it up so they could find themselves for failure, quit at a 30% higher rate than people who didn't have access to that kind of a commitment account. So what that wow. says to me is sort of, you know, these kinds of strong commitments, they do really add value. And, and while again, there's some evidence suggesting things like pledges publicly can be useful. I think it has to, it has to be like, if you're pledging to your, say your partner or a, a good friend, you may not be that humiliate you, you may know your relationship will be repaired and they'll be fine. And so it may not work as well. The study that I write about in the book is of doctors putting pledges in their offices, um, publicly facing patients. And that's, I think, probably a, a costlier pledge to break than some of the kinds of pledges we often use to try to, to motivate ourselves to achieve our goals. Yeah, Angela Duckworth uh, has written the foreword of your book. And, uh, you know, she talks about you like a superwoman. And most people who have written about you is written about like super organized, super sharp person. But even you sometimes occasionally forget stuff. Is that not right? Well, so first of all, Angela's introduction to my book was far too kind. It was clearly written by a very good friend and um, very generous. And I'm certainly not a superwoman. Uh, actually, another interesting thing I think about human nature that um, that is worth pointing out is that uh, you know we can be really great at figuring out strategies and solutions in some parts of our lives and struggle in others. <laughs> and I would say I'm really good in the work dimension and definitely less of a superhuman in other dimensions. So you know. Part of why I study this is it's me search. I struggle with all of these foibles, and, but I have, I have taken an approach in life of sort of thinking like an engineer and trying to solve the problems that I face um, strategically. And that's, that's really what sort of the science points to and the book points to as well. Okay, but that wasn't your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to get that out of the way. And let me, let me come back. Actually, can you, can you cue me one more time since you, you see, oh, yeah. it's perfect. I forgot. It was a question about <laughs> forgetting. Um, I really didn't do that theatrically. It just happened. Yes, I forget. Forgetting is actually one of the biggest barriers for me. I have a mediocre memory at, at best. In fact, in the book, I think I admitted to a time when I, I scheduled a meeting on a Monday morning yeah. with a, a friend. <laughs> yeah, it, more than a friend, like a mentor or someone I admired immensely, like a really famous uh, behavioral economist was coming in from out of town. He's going to come meet me for breakfast. I'm so excited. This is going to be amazing. Uh, he reconfirmed on Friday afternoon. Yep. I'll be there. And then Monday morning, guess who didn't show up? That was me. Uh, and I get this, this email when I'm looking at my email, uh, at like 8 AM, like, Ooh, did one of us goof? And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm 45 minutes late for a 45 minute breakfast meeting. I cannot believe I did that. And you know, it wasn't, there's no intentionality. I was highly motivated to show up and yet it wasn't part of my regular routine. I had sort of moved on with life and I just forgot. And so, um, it's common. We all have these experiences. I talked about a friend who, you know, forgot to vote and how common forgetting to vote is forgetting these sort of one-time activities that are highly consequential um, and that we can care about. Like you, you forget to get the colonoscopy that's so important, you know, whatever it is, there's all these things we forget to do that can be really, you forget to set up a 401k or a savings deduction for your account for years. And then you don't accumulate the retirement savings you need. I think we underestimate actually, in fact, I know because I've done research on this, we think forgetting is this like mild, not a big deal, reschedule, not a problem, but it actually can have pretty pernicious consequences, especially when it comes to like the one-time activities that, that accumulate so much in life. So I think recognizing this as a, as a real problem and making sure we structure our environments and our choice, uh, our choices to facilitate remembering with timely reminders, um, by making concrete plans that sort of have cues built into them. So we will trigger follow through is really important. And I'm happy to dive into any more of that if you'd like. Yeah, like perhaps checklists, the Ben Franklin way, do something like, you know, you point out a bunch of techniques that we can all use to not forget as much. 
Yes. Yes, exactly. Sort of as soon as you become sophisticated about forgetting and start using those kinds of tools, better outcomes ensue. And so I think it's, it's just so important to structure your life with a recognition that you are going to forget things if you don't if you don't, you know, set up timely reminders, if you don't have checklists and tools. And of course, Atul Gawande's Checklist Manifesto uh, is a fabulous book about just how important this can be in professional contexts and in surgery, right? Adding checklists uh, just improves outcomes dramatically because in the heat of the moment, there's a lot going on and things get overlooked that can be a matter of life or death. And once you use simple tools, we can overcome some of those key barriers to change. <laughs> Um, I found this sentence so fascinating. Too much of rigidity is the enemy of good habit. Could you elaborate a bit more? And why is this sentence, uh, you know, there in the book? Yeah, this is, this is maybe the most, this comes from a study I did that might be the most, I think, important I've ever done, at least in terms of changing my own thinking and, and flying in the face of expectations of um, scholars of habit. I was really interested- Adam rethinking. Oh, yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, great uh, connection to one of my favorite um, thinkers at, at Wharton and, and a brilliant colleague. Um, I did this experiment at Google to test a hypothesis my collaborator, John Bashirs of Harvard Business School and I had about sort of an ideal way to kickstart lasting habits. And I should say we were building on the shoulders of giants, lots of great research, particularly by Wendy Wood of USC, who's an amazing scholar of habit, suggested that habits are formed in a way that's, I think, by the way, been well publicized and written about, you know, the power of habit by Charles Duhigg. Atomic habits both popularize this idea that there's sort of a, a simple loop where, um, you know, if you take an action repeatedly under the sort of same circumstances, and then you reward that action, you're going to build a habit that lasts. And, and so I, I was influenced by all of that work and wanted to see if we could turn that into a, I'll say like a behavior change kickstart program. So we teamed up with Google. Uh, they were interested in getting more of their employees using gyms regularly. There are a lot of employees who wanted to improve their wellness. So 2,500 Googlers signed up for this program we developed to try to see if we could help them build lasting habits. And our hypothesis was if we could create more consistency in the way people were engaging in their exercise, um, that would be really critical to creating a lasting habit. So we built a one month program and we randomly assigned some people to get encouragement to visit the gym basically at the same time of day, every time they went. So everybody in our study actually told us what's the ideal time for them. And some people got sort of bonus rewards for a month if their visits to the gym were within this narrow time interval. Another group also planned when they like to go to the gym, told us their best time, but they got the same rewards regardless of when they went to the gym. And what right. we ended up with is two groups who went to the gym at the same frequency for a month, um, but one of whom went uh, at much more consistent time. So like they were say 7 a.m. was their ideal time. Like 85% of their workouts were at, were at um at, at that time. And another group who say also chose that as their ideal time, but only about half of their workouts were at that time. They, had, they, you know, worked out in a much wider range of times. Okay. Can same frequency, different levels of flexibility, sort of different levels of variety in when they did this activity. Okay. Then the program ends, we let go. And what we're really interested in is which group has built a more lasting habit and will keep going to the gym. Is it the group that has been sort of really consistently going at the same time or the group that's been going in a less regular routinized way? We were sure it was going to be the group that was consistent and we were wrong. And here's why. <laughs> when we dug into the data, what we found is those people who had who had sort of gone at the same time so consistently, they were a little bit more likely, say they were a 7 a.m. workout person, they were slightly more likely to keep going at 7 a.m. than someone else who had had a more flexible schedule throughout the month when we were trying to kickstart a habit. So that was true, that it built this sort of 7 a.m. workout habit a little bit more, but if they didn't go at 7 a.m., they didn't go at all. So they become really rigid. So if, if they didn't hit their sort of ideal workout time, they threw up their hands and gave up. Whereas the flexible folks, the people who'd been going at different times, they went slightly less at their sort of magic time, their ideal time. But if they missed their 7 a.m. workout, well, then maybe they go at noon or maybe they go at 
5 p.m. They learn to be flexible as opposed to rigid around achieving this goal and getting getting their exercise in. And I thought this was such an important insight and realized sort of as soon as we started analyzing the data and writing, wow, I see this in so much of life that if we become too rigid in the way we try to achieve our goals or build our habits, that that actually is the enemy of, con of, of consistency because life gets in the way. Life is not a perfect uh, you know, it's not always going to be possible to do things at the same time in the same place. And so ideally what we're building when we build a habit or a routine is there is an ideal time, but we've learned how to do it no matter what, not only under this very specific set of circumstances. So I think that was a really important insight from the work that I share in the book. Yeah. And I think, again, given the pandemic, this is one insight, which I think our listeners will benefit so much from the flexibility that can be rooted in or factored in as we make plans. You know, uh, Katie, now we're coming to the section which uh, is so, so relevant to network capital. This section really made, uh, you know, I reread it so many times, this particular chapter. So uh, now I get to ask the author directly, should one give unsolicited advice? Well, <laughs> I'm gonna say it depends. Uh, it depends on, you know, like how extreme the situation is. You really need to intervene and give someone unsolicited advice. I'm a parent, so I'm not going to say never give unsolicited <laughs> advice, but, uh, what the brilliant psychologist, my, you give advice to your students, your, and your kids. <laughs> sometimes you've got to get in there with a little unsolicited advice, but what, um, my, really brilliant collaborator, uh, Lauren Estress Winkler, psychologist at the Kellogg School at Northwestern, realized is that too often when someone is struggling with a goal, our go-to is, let me give them some unsolicited advice. And that actually can really depress their confidence, right? If they've been struggling with something and you sort of waltz in and say like, hey, I, here's my two cents on this topic, what you're doing is saying like, I kind of think you're a moron. <laughs> <laughs> You're, I think that if I just think about this for a moment, I'm going to have a better idea than you do. And she wondered if we should actually flip the script, if a better way to boost confidence when that's a barrier to goal achievement, which is, which it is often, not always, but sometimes when people like sort of are down on their luck, things haven't been going well, they're struggling instead of like putting our arm around them and asking uh, and telling them what to do. Maybe we should ask them what they would advise someone else in their situation to do. Maybe we can actually put them on a pedestal by turning them to a, into an advice giver and a mentor and a coach about this very same challenge. And that will imply to them, we believe they've got what it takes. They have the insights. She realized, so that's going to build confidence and motivation. It might cause people to dredge up insights they might not have gone looking for just to help themselves. But now I'm, I'm coaching someone else. I have to figure out something to say, and they may come up with ideas they hadn't realized they even had before that are going to be relevant to them because, you know, those are the kinds of ideas we can come up with are things that would be relevant to us in general. And then finally, once we give someone else advice, we're going to feel hypocritical if we don't walk the talk ourselves. So she's done a number of really creative random assignment studies showing that when we put someone in the position of advice giver, instead of just giving them advice, it boosts their motivation, improves their outcomes. Um, one of them was a study I got to partner on where we randomly assigned high school students to either give a few minutes of advice at the beginning of the second semester to other students who are their younger peers on how to study more effectively. That's one group. And then a control group just doesn't give advice. And what we found is being put in the position of mentor and coach actually improves students' own performance in math classes and in the class they most wanted to improve in. You know, it didn't turn C students into valedictorians. I think it's really important to understand this was a small effect, but third quarter grades improved in those classes significantly with a 10 minute intervention that was digital, just asking people to advise their peers and reflect on what strategies would help them study more effectively. So I think it's a tool we all probably should be using more to help others and to help ourselves is, Think about how we can put other people in the position of advice giver so they'll come up with these insights and have this confidence boost. And also for ourselves, if we're struggling with something, sometimes we can benefit from, and I've done this, forming an advice club, um, putting yourself right. in a position where you're, you're both learning from others in a solicited advice environment where you solicit their advice and they're coming to you when they have challenges related to a, a shared goal. And that gives you confidence and, and builds your confidence that actually you have something to add because we all do have a lot of insight about what will work in, in different situations. And you'll sort of practice and rehearse and say, hey, like, I think you should do this. And then when we face a similar challenge, we're going to feel hypocritical not taking our own advice. We're going to have more confidence that we know what to do because we've already thought this through and coached someone else on it um, and sort of 
and it also builds um, social bonds that are useful. So advice clubs are something we can all, I think, try to adopt more when we have shared goals with friends. Yeah, this particular insight we actually plan to implement in our school. So we we run a bunch of school for for, for students between eight and set eighteen years of age, and we also work with the government uh, through the initiative. We serve two point five million students. We're actually going to take this insight of your experiment and try it out. Hopefully, send you the data that we collect. That'll be interesting. Amazing. Advice taken. Um, um, you know. Confidence is a is something that you talk about as well. A goal uh, achieving the goals and having the confidence to do so. Could you elaborate a, a bit more about what happens when our own confidence drops, um, and what can be uh, some ways that we can lift our confidence and meet the goals? Yeah, and I I also want to note that confidence is a is a tricky topic when it comes to behavior change because like you can have too much of it, and then you think you know all I need are, is like a fresh start and then I'll achieve everything. And you don't sort of right. set yourself up for success by recognizing that you have limitations and you need to build around them. But if you don't have any confidence, right? If you lack confidence or you lack um, the confidence to think you can sort of stand up again after a goal failure, that's also a major barrier. So it's this like tightrope we're walking a little bit when we think about confidence. And my colleague, Don Moore at um, University of California at um, Berkeley's Haas School has a wonderful book called Perfectly Confident that I recommend that's sort of about how do we walk that line. But I do think I do think recognizing that sometimes confidence is a barrier can be really important, particularly for managers or teachers. Anytime you're coaching someone else, recognizing that they do need to feel that you believe in them and then to believe in themselves in order to keep going is so important. Um, a couple of lines of work that come to mind that, that help with this. One is Carol Dweck of Stanford, who's done brilliant research on mindset and growth mindset in particular, and how important that is for kids and for achievement more generally. And that a lot of us go through life with what she'd call a fixed mindset, like a belief that intelligence is fixed. Um, we're sort of stuck with what we've got, but that if we can um, try to pivot and have more of a growth mindset, which is accurate, which is that um, intelligence is something you can grow with practice and, and effort. And, and so are other skills we can grow and, and improve as opposed to thinking of them as fixed. People achieve more. They're more willing to learn from failures and sort of stand up again, instead of saying, you know, I, I simply can't achieve this. They can say, I can grow to achieve this. And so mindset is really important. And that's a kind, it's part of confidence is recognizing that you have have the ability to grow um, and what we believe shapes the step you know what we what we try to achieve so it, it's important to try to to build a growth mindset and to to foster it in others around you that belief in themselves and that they can achieve more so that they will yes yes absolutely so uh, you have a mentor I'm, I'm pretty sure you have a tribe of mentors and you mentor like hundreds and thousands people but you have an academic mentor that you talk about in the book and uh, you've gone to that person uh, many times for advice what did you learn from him about advice that you thought was counterintuitive at the time but now it makes a lot more sense now that you've written the book and conducted a whole bunch of research yeah, I was so lucky to have this amazing mentor in graduate school. Once I sort of figured out that I was interested in behavioral science and pivoted away from engineering, I wandered into his office and he took me in, an orphan uh, at the time. Um, his name is Max Bazerman. He's a professor at Harvard Business School, and he is one of the most successful mentors, if not the most successful mentor in our field. His students are sort of professors at all the top universities. I don't know of any student of his actually who didn't end up um, sort of getting a top tier academic job and having great success. It's, it's a remarkable track record. Um, and he was, a, you know, when I became a mentor myself, I looked back on what he had done. Like I was trying to figure out, cause I'm an engineer and that's how I think like, what was his formula? Like what, what did he do that was so different and why did everybody have these great outcomes? And one of the things I sort of realized and I think, I'm not sure he even would totally agree with, but maybe a bit more so than um, now that we've talked about it extensively and I've written about it in my book. He did all the usual stuff that a, men a good mentor does, right? You know, he responded quickly to emails. He had students, you know, introduce them and network them. And he, uh, you know, sp spent a lot of time engaging with us on the science, but he also 
really believed in his students and conveyed like this absolute rock solid confidence in them. And he really rarely gave unsolicited advice. He was very mm. hands off in a lot of ways. He would actually pair up senior students with more junior students on projects and sort of have them do the, the um, coaching and, and leading of the team project. So everybody gets in the position of advice giver and mentor as they're going through um, their doctoral program. And, and he was, he was pretty hands off. Like he would give solicited advice occasionally, but rarely, mostly it was, we came and we said, Oh, I have a problem help. And then he gave this wonderful wisdom. Um, and, and just like sort of that combination of traits and, and strategies, I think was so important as I look back and fostering success or this, I believe in you, you can do it. It's going to be okay. As opposed to like, Oh yeah, this is really flawed <laughs> or like, Oh, this is, you know, you didn't do so well at this. He, he rarely criticized which, um, and, and instead sort of guided gently towards um, better paths. And, and he built my confidence, the confidence of other students through the strategy of, of primarily providing solicited feedback and putting us in the position of mentors and advice givers. Uh, and I think that was so important and I've tried to emulate it. I'm, I'm nothing and it's sort of like him in terms of my success as a mentor, but, and, and I don't think I've, I always practice what I preach perfectly, but I do try to, um, in my students and, and anyone who ends up in a PhD program at a top university as, as uh, my students have really is remarkably gifted in so many ways. And I try to sort of focus on, on that when giving feedback right. and what are the strengths as opposed to harping on weaknesses, which I don't think is very productive. Um, I mean, it, it, there, there is a time and place for it, but there's a way to grow it without, without, I think, cutting people down. And, and there's so, there's a large lack of confidence in graduate programs. There's this awful study recently released showing that, um, the mental health of, uh, PhD students in top social science programs is about similar to mental health of prisoner populations. It's like a really, that sounds crazy. I but was there, so shocked when I read that in your book, you know, I mean, that was crazy. It's a yeah. stressful experience. There's like a huge amount of career uncertainty. You're like constantly comparing yourself to these other people who've achieved so much in academia. You, you don't yet know where you're going to live, whether you'll ever get a job, you know, the, it's tough and it is really sad that there's that, but I think that that makes it an even more important environment to come in and be the kind of mentor who says like, you can do, you know, who, who believes in you and shows you that constantly and gives you that confidence boost in that kind of an environment. Right. And yeah, since we're on that topic, just to, uh, to wrap things up, um, uh, peer approval is something that I think matters to all of us, but the entire academia in a way requires peer reviews, peer approval, Really lots of collaboration. Um, how do we not succumb to peer approval and yet make sense of peer effects? Mm, that's a really interesting question. Um, not succumbing to peer pressure is really difficult. There's some research that's been done. Actually, this was, uh, you know, a lot of research on peer pressure was stimulated of all things by uh, the Holocaust because there were psychologists, um, Solomon Ash, Stanley Milgram, uh, a couple of leading names in the 1950s were just trying to understand how so many people could have been complicit in such atrocities. And of course there have been many awful um, atrocities since. So the, the Holocaust is just what motivated this set of research. What one of the answers that they came up with was peer pressure. That when everyone else is doing it, we look around and we say, oh, this is normal, this is approval, this is acceptable, and it changes our beliefs about how it's okay to behave. Um, of course, with the lens of, okay, these are atrocities that people are committing, how are we gonna prevent that? They had some insights about what can lessen peer pressure and make it easier to deviate when it's the wrong path. Um, things that they showed seem to make it easier to not comply with peer pressure include social distance. So meaning, you know, we're talking on the phone instead of face-to-face, -face, or we're talking on Zoom instead of face-to-face, -face. that actually reduces pressure. Um, so if you can distance yourself from someone, um, that can be a helpful tool for being less le le willing to comply. And, and maybe the, the most helpful tool, frankly, is sort of the, the more distance you can give yourself the better. And I guess I'd say another tool is if you even have sort of one person who sees the world the way you do and is willing to speak up, 
that's incredibly important for, for, and sort of colluding with someone else who sees the world the way you do, or has similar goals and talking and making sure you'll both support each other is really important to being able to break away from peer pressure. <clears throat> so th those are a couple of things we can do when we face peer pressure that's negative. I mostly write about peer, how to use and harness peer pressure for positive effect in my right. book, because that's really the focus is like, how do we use all of the different powerful tools that are out there to create change? And the, the advice I offer is, well, there's a few pieces of advice, but one piece of advice is when possible to structure your peer group. Uh, um, this is sort of related to advice clubs. Can you find other people who have similar goals and who are making strides towards them that aren't you know, so far out of reach that they're going to demotivate you, nor, yeah. um, nor people who are like, don't believe in you or, or aren't achieving. Um, when you have a peer group that has similar goals and ambitions and is sort of showing you what's possible, that can be really helpful. So you want to run a marathon, you know, maybe don't hang out around other people who have no interest in running a marathon so much as other people who are also striving towards that goal. Maybe a couple of people ideally who have even run one before and those role models and that um, peer reinforcement can show you what's possible. You can actually be deliberate about trying to copy and paste strategies that work for others. And I've done research with um, Katie Mayer, a PhD student at Wharton and Angela Duckworth um, showing that if you deliberately copy and paste strategies from other people. If we sort of coax someone, hey, go look for someone else who's achieving this, look for a hack that they've used and try it out yourself. That is effective. You'd think like through osmosis, just being around peers, it would all magically happen. And there is some osmosis. Like if you were randomly assigned a roommate in college who has better, you know, is a better uh, student, you end up having better grades yourself. So that's sort of an osmosis effect, but just telling you go copy what they're doing strategically. We have some research showing you can do even better if you're more deliberate about copying and pasting. So those are some ways we can harness peer pressure to help achieve more as well. It's been such a pleasure, one, reading your book, reading your research, uh, listening to your podcast, and then just like having you on our uh, masterclass on network capital. This goes out to 100,000 plus people, and I'm sure they will benefit from reading your book uh, from Middle East to the Europe to, to America and so forth. Thank you so much for your time and for your insights, Dr. Thank Mahmoud. you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been tremendously fun. I'm sorry I don't have another hour to keep talking because this has been a real treat. <laughs> Thanks for all the work you do.